Hey, for you. Just move that out of the way. Thank you. Well, thank you for bringing Mark here today. Thank you that uh, uh, he's come. He's got uh, a word from you for us. Uh, Father, be with him now. Bless him and keep him. S help him speak it in power and in might. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much. Well, it's lovely to be with you guys. And... Um, I look around and I see lots of friendly faces of people that I know, so it's lovely to see you here and have known over the years. Um, uh, it's, it's always great, isn't it, to be... I'm, I'm just aware that we're in an area where we all pray for the same area all the time and uh, actively at work in the same area. We were doing prayer on the streets. I think you just still do prayer on the streets, do you? We were doing prayer on the streets in Broadway the other day and... and um, Really terrific, thinking, uh, you know, as people are going through, they're coming from Acton, back to Acton. It's like, you know, it's, it's one, one big shared kingdom. So thank you for all that you're doing as we work alongside you. So we're in Isaiah 61, and um, Tim's given me uh, what he said. He said actually speak on two words. But, um, he wanted me to be short, I think. That's his aim. Um, uh, but Isaiah 61, 1 to 8. And... and um, I'll read some of it in a minute, but, but, but verse 8 particularly. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully reward my people for their suffering and make an everlasting covenant with them. We're going to be thinking about the everlasting covenant that God made with us. Just to introduce myself, so I'm the pastor of St. Paul's Ealing, um, on the leadership team of New Wine, and um, been... Uh, church leader in this area for 24 years. Um, uh, and I'm not quite sure why I've been around so long, but I've been around a long time. Um, and uh, uh, just, you know, it's, it's, we've got five little church plants that we've done out in the area and, and further afield. And um, uh, it's, it's really great, actually, to see this area, to be part of, I think it's good to be part of an ongoing generational change in the area and to see what God is doing in our area. Um, so, uh, the everlasting covenant. I bet you, like me, I bet you've let people down in the past. Um, I've let people down. I've broken promises. Have you done that? I remember when I had, I was watching the little children here at the beginning, and I was thinking, uh, my, my, my youngest son is 18 on Wednesday. He had a party last night. Oh, my word. Uh, in our house. Actually, they were mainly in the garden, but they were in our house, and... Um, and uh, I said that I would control the alcohol levels. And so I bought all the alcohol and then rapidly confiscated an exceeding amount of alcohol that came in with the 18-year-olds um, and uh, said, you can collect that on the way out. And um, uh, uh, just, just the, the uh, extraordinary thing of celebrating your children getting to a particular age. I'm just at that stage where my oldest child with her husband, who have moved back in with us because they're got no money they're boomerang kids and um, they've come moved back in with us and um, they're expecting our first grandchild in January so we're very excited about that because of course that we'll have a grandchild in our home for the next couple of years but I was just watching those little children play there and I remember when my children were tiny saying to them they said daddy will you play with me now and I said I'll get there in a minute I'll get there in a minute then the moments passed and I didn't get there you know that feeling and you break a promise so easy to do, isn't it? I'm sure I'm not the only one here, but my, my PA calls me a sieve head. Because I, I say I'll do something and then I forget to do it. And I really genuinely mean I'm going to do it. And my wife sometimes, she says to me, she says, if I'm working at home throughout the day, and she's off, she works as a psychotherapist a couple of days a week, and as, as she goes off to work in the morning, she leaves about seven in the morning, and she'll say to me, I'll put a wash load on, can you hang it out? And I'm thinking, yeah, I'll do that, darling, no props. And um, I forget. And it gets to the end of the day, she comes back in and she says, you didn't hang the washing out. And I said, I knew there was something <laughs> you'd asked me to do. You know, it just goes from your head and you break a promise. It's so easy to do, isn't it? So easy to break promises. And, and, and what we're thinking about is a a God of promises. In fact, a covenant, the everlasting covenant that he talks about here is a covenant slightly different to a promise. If 
I, if I take you back in Scripture, this, this is God's covenant. If I take you right back in, to Adam and Eve. Here's Adam and Eve in the beginning of the Bible. What happens is, is everything is good for them, and then they make a mistake. Then they go against God. Then there is the fall. There is a moment where everything starts to go wrong. And it's, a, it's an incredible picture, actually, of your life and my life. Where, where we do stuff in life and, and, and everything then starts going wrong and suddenly we, we need to know, is there a different way? Is there a different story that we can take? Is there a different story that we can live? And it's at that moment when Adam and Eve fall that the beginning of the story of the covenant begins and God makes a covenant because he, he makes a plan for his people. And actually, the covenant comes into being in Genesis chapter 12 in the, when Abraham comes on the scene. It's an Abrahamic covenant, it says. And in Genesis chapter 12, do you remember he says, and I will, I will bless you and I will make you, a, your, you'll be a blessing to the nations and your, your families will be blessed through you. All the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. That's the covenant. The covenant is a promise that actually that begins with Abraham, that's renewed and restored again and again as God reminds his people that he is a covenant God. A, a covenant is something greater than a promise. There are, there are two types of covenants. There's a, a conditional covenant and there's an unconditional covenant. The conditional covenant is this in the Bible. A conditional covenant, and we use it still today. We sign covenant things. A conditional, a conditional covenant is a covenant that requires two people or two organizations to fulfill it. So a conditional covenant requires something from you and something from me. That's a covenant that we can make together. An unconditional covenant requires nothing from you and everything from me. I will promise to do something whatever you do. And the everlasting covenant talked about here in Isaiah is the unconditional covenant of God that came into place right back at the beginning of Abraham that said, I have made my promises to you and they will be fulfilled. Because it is not dependent upon us, but solely dependent on our relationship with God. I will therefore make you, he says, a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. And I will bless those who bless you. So therefore, this unconditional, everlasting covenant that's talked about here in Isaiah means that all the promises of God that are written about in the Bible will come true. All the promises of God that are written about in the Old Testament will come true. All the promises of God that are written about in the New Testament will come true. All the things that God says will come about will come about, not because of anything that we necessarily do, but because he's a covenant God. And he's made an everlasting covenant with us. What does that mean for us today? Let's just have a look at this. Passage, Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his glory. They will rebuild, rebuild the ancient ruined, repairing cities destroyed long ago. They will revive them, though they have been deserted for many generations. Foreigners will be your servants. They will feed your flocks and plow your fields and tend your vineyards. And you'll be called priests of the Lord, ministers of our God. You will, feed on, you will feed on the treasures of the nations and boast in their riches. Instead of shame and dishonor, you'll enjoy a double share of honor. And you will possess a double portion of the prosperity of the land. And everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. And I will faithfully reward my people for all their suffering and make an everlasting covenant with them. I, 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 what I love about that is, is, is the assurance, I will rebuild, I will restore, I will renew. 
This is what it's about. It's not about what we do, but it's about what God does. And, and what God does is ask us to put ourselves into his hands. I don't know, um, uh, Paul uses that lovely description, doesn't he, in, in um, uh, Ephesians. He uses it all over the place, actually, but particularly in Ephesians, he talks about us being in Christ. Do you know that story, that, that word? We're in Christ. In other words, we've, we've been given a new identity in Christ. This is who we are. It's nothing to do with what we've done, but absolutely everything to do with what God has done. So if you, if you use one word, I say this to my church all the time, if you use one word to sum up Christianity, it's this, it's done. It's done. It's done for us. Christ has done it on the cross. We're in Christ. We've been given a new identity in Christ. And, 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 and if we know that, if we know that, everlasting covenant, if we know that promise of God, if we know that it is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, this is what we know. It means that we have hope. It means that instead of despair, you will have hope. It means instead of brokenness, you will have healing. It means that instead of unanswered prayers, you will have answered prayers. It means that the promises of God will go before us, because God is a restoring God. That's what this passage says. Here's, I, I, my, my, my young adults at home have come back from university. They've all moved in. It's terrible. And there, there is a point at which they should move out. That's what I've decided. <laughs> Lindsay and I go out far more now than we would normally do because we just like to get out and be on our own. <laughs> it's like we'll leave them at home. We'll go out. But this, this, is, what, this is what we've discovered. They come back in, they put the television on all the time. We're not a great television couple. We don't really watch TV. In fact, it sits in the corner of the room, never goes on. That's what it's like. But they come in and they watch these programs. And uh, they watch these programs. This is one of their favorite things. They watch these programs that restore houses. Have you watched that? Yeah, and then they do that. It's, uh, they ask the question at the end of every program. And when they restore these houses, they say, did you keep within your budget? And what a stupid question <laughs> to ask, because no one's ever kept within their budget, as far as I can work out. But what, what, they, what they do is, is they, take, they take a house. I mean, I just saw one the other day. It's just a really, it was a really ugly house, but it had a lake out the back. Was that, I mean, it was a lake that was supposed to be there, not a lake that wasn't supposed to be there. It was a lake out the back. And they took this really ugly house, and... And they did this extension, and it seemed to be what they did was they unfolded the whole house in this extension, and it was phenomenal. It was in Manchester. It was phenomenal. Well, the finished product was amazing. I was looking at it going, that's incredible. I mean, I'd come in at the beginning of the program, come out again, and then I'd gone in to deliver the tea and seen what they'd done. I thought, that's amazing. Was that really the same house? And they showed the change. And this is, that's, what, that's the business God's in. God takes us and he enfolds our lives into him and he restores us as individuals. And that's exactly what he does also with our society, with our culture, with our community. He restores what we're like back to his image. As we're made, everything we talk about goes back to Genesis, doesn't it? Man, man and woman. Men and, men and women made in the image of God. And God's in the restoring business as he restores us back to his image. That's the picture we get in scripture of this everlasting covenant. And if it's an everlasting covenant that points to Jesus Christ, this is the promise that we can believe about this, is that God is not just a God of the everlasting covenant that gives restoration in our lives. Therefore, he, he, he doesn't just reshape our lives. He doesn't just take me as a person. He doesn't just say, what's the world like with Mark Mellorish in it? I need to reshape him. He says, what's the world like with Mark Mellorish in it as I uniquely designed him to be? What, is, what difference does that world make with him in it doing what he's supposed to do? He restores us back to his original image. That's the work that he does, called discipleship, but that's the work he does on our lives throughout our lives. And if we believe that that is the case and that all of this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, this is what we can believe, that our God is the God of the resurrection. He's the God of the resurrection. He's the God of the resurrection hope. He's the God of the new beginning. He's the God who will take what we have, that that is dead and broken, and he will resurrect it. He will resurrect our lives. And I love that. 
I love that. What does that mean? Well, to the, to the person in debt, that's what it means. That you have a cap center. To the person in debt, resurrection means someone who will enable them out of debt. That what I love is that God takes us and uses us as part of the story of bringing his resurrection into people's lives. What does that mean to be to someone in a broken relationship? That means that we will walk alongside them and we will help them find resurrection in their relationship. Whether that's resurrection to a new relationship or the resurrection and restoration of that relationship. But the point is, God's a God of the resurrection. Always a resurrection. Always taking our lives and again, re- 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 restoring them and then resurrecting them uh, with him. What does it mean? What does it mean for, for uh, the person who's lonely? It means a friend in community. See, it was Mother Teresa that said, loneliness is the greatest disease on the face of the earth. The community of the church is more important than we possibly ever could think it would be. That actually we be that community. <coughs> I love the fact that you were having a party last night. That's, that's, that, that's the way it should be, shouldn't it? That we're a community of people that party in life together and invite others into the party of God who say we want to include you. We want you to be part of this ongoing story where we see resurrection come in our lives because we believe that we're a community that's being restored back to the image of God. To those who are, who are lonely, Resurrection means a friend. For those who are bereaved, resurrection means someone walking alongside them. All of these promises in God are ever a part of the everlasting covenant. It's not. It, it's about hope. We're to be. We're dealers in hope, aren't we? We're dealers in hope. Dealers in hope are people who take hope into every situation they go into. That we'll be people who walk with hope in our lives. So whatever anybody says, we'll walk with hope. How does that work out in our lives? Well, I love it when I read the book of Acts and I read about this New Testament church and what the early Christian church did. This is what happens, or this is what I would suggest it happens, is that in the early church, everybody seemed to have had a a life-changing encounter with Jesus or a life-changing encounter with someone who had met Jesus. It's just an extraordinary picture you get of this this community of people that turned the world upside down. It was more than just a knowledge. It was more than just a few prayers said. It was more than just Sunday attendance. It was this life-changing encounter that enabled them to live with the ever-present reality of the everlasting covenant in their lives on a daily basis. So how does that affect us? Well, we've been worshipping just now, haven't we? This this had it affect. I'm I'm a I'm a Watford Football Club supporter. That's a bit of an exaggeration. I was a Watford Football Club supporter when I was young, and I still follow them when I hear the results. <laughs> it's about as much as a follower I am. But uh, you know, I, I, people know that I support Watford Football Club. So if I'm looking for any football club results, I look at Watford. But if you ask me who their manager was or the name of any of their players or who they were playing, I would not have the foggiest idea. There aren't many of us who support them. But this is the thing. This is the thing. Over the years, so I followed, I I used to go and watch them every Saturday. But over the years, this is the thing. I've watched them lose and lose and lose and lose and lose again. And this is what I learned. You only sing when you're winning. Well, that's the little phrase, that's the little chant they have, isn't it? Oh, you only sing when you're winning. That's the chant they have in the football club. And when we're losing, we go quiet. But when we're winning, we sing out with confidence. So when we gather as a church to worship, we gather to worship. Why? Because we're singing because we're on the winning team. We're singing actually, reminding ourselves. I think there's some fantastic songs come up just now. I love that last one we sang, or one before last we sang, that's just like a whole loads of verses, isn't it? You know, a hundred billion times, whatever it is. Um, it's, great, it's, really great, it's really great theology. Um, it's really, I'm not sure it's totally true, the hundred billion times the bit, but it's, it sounds good. But, it, but, the whole, the, but, but actually, the, the theology of it is actually very good. 
This is what we do. If, 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 the, if the mountains bow before you, so will I. If creation sings your praises, well, so will I. We'll continue to do it. What made the early church grow? Here's what happened. What happened when Peter and John and the others were thrown in prison? What did they do? They sang praises to God. Because though, although it looked like they were losing, actually they were still winning. And although sometimes people can talk of the church, you know, what's happening with the church today? Oh, it's shrinking around the world. Oh, it's, it's, it's actually not shrinking around the world. It's just the center of gravity of church membership and, and what God is doing is shifting. And of course, the biggest shift at the moment is going towards China, and that's the fastest growing place of faith in the world. And you see, actually, that, that the number of Christians is still expanding. We're more than a third of the world's population, and we've got millions upon millions of people following God. That's what's happening. Um, and, and, and therefore, we continue to be on the winning side. And okay, we can sing the praises of God. Peter and John, they sang when they were in prison. That's the difference. We're people who don't lose hope. We're people who have a, a full assurance of the everlasting covenant. We're part of this great ongoing story of God, this everlasting tapestry that says, God is putting all of this back together. I was in Wilma Scrubs uh, two weeks ago. Incredible moment. It's the end of a course on restoration. I don't know if any of you volunteer in there, but we've got a st- I've employed a staff member 20 years ago called Ray, and he, he came to me one Sunday and he said, I believe God's called me to work in prison. Can you employ me to do it? And I was like, well, probably not, right, actually. But, you know, and he said, no, you should, because God's called me to do this. So we'd, we worked out a way of getting him a job, and he's worked for us for 20 years. And he said to me, he said, I want you to come into the end of this course. And, and the governor was there, and I was there, and we were doing presentations. And prisoners came and told their stories. And one of them, I mean, they all told different stories. So they're making restitution for what they have done wrong. And in my little group... Normally, you, you never ask a prisoner what they've done. You never. Never ask them. Never ask an inmate what they've done. And in my little group, one guy, he said, um, he said well, we, they were doing creative things. And he said, oh, well, we could do this. And we've got to make restitution to the person. There's someone who came in and told their story who actually was held up at gunpoint. Um, and we had to make restitution. And this guy said, well, he said, well, it's not one individual I've, I've offended against. So I said, oh, well, what, what can we do? I, of course, I had, didn't click. I said, oh, well, uh, what can we do about that? He said, I said, well, who have you offended against then? He said, well, a whole community, because I dealt heroin for years. I'm like, okay, so you're a drug dealer. Well, you were a drug dealer. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I... Then another guy in my little group, he said, yeah, I dealt drugs as well. This, I said, it's a whole community. I'm like, oh, my word, we've got two drug dealers here. And I thought, this is very interesting. Well, he never normally asks what you do. And then the guy, the other guy said, well, if we're all confessing properly, he said, I murdered somebody. I was like, okay, <laughs> really nice to meet you. I've got two drug dealers and a murderer in my group. This is really... And then the other guy, he said, well, I'm an armed robber. Oh, fantastic. I said, this is quite an exciting group. And then they came. You had never seen it. Like I was, I was in tears. This is what they did. They came and they did dramas. And they re- made re- restitution for what they'd done wrong. They read poems. They wrote stories. And the murderer, this was his, his poem. I can't tell you exactly what it was, but I'll tell you except about what it was. He used the w- number 15. He said... He read a poem and he said, 15 drinks too many, 15 moments of madness. The knife was there, it slipped right in, 15 minutes to death. He said, now I've been inside 15 months, 15 years to go. My life wasted, a family's life ruined. What have I done? But God came. And he took my 15, and he's given me eternity. And he then prayed for everybody. And they go, I mean, you, you could have heard a pin drop. I mean, it was much longer than that. And I was thinking, that's what God does. He takes the most broken and the hurting, and he what restores them back to the image of God. And he gives them hope for a future and what he did with this guy is he took him to the place where he learned I need to be sorry for what I did in my life 
in the past and I need the, someone to give me the grace to change. And this group gave them the grace to change. And it was pride you gave him the certificate. I said, well done. And everything in me says you've changed in 15 months. <laughs> we need to pray for you now for the next 15 years that you hang in there and make a difference. And Ray's been doing this for 20 years. And I can tell you this, we've had four people leave Worm and Scrubs with degrees in theology who are now leading churches who previously were offenders. So this is an ongoing story that we're saying, but that's the God that we deal with. Why? He's a God of the everlasting covenant, and he never writes anybody off because he's a God who deals in hope the whole time. I could tell you story after story, really, but that's what we're about, friends. We have a God who takes us who's so committed to us that he reshapes us that we would fit his image and paint a different picture in society. What a privilege, as Paul talks about us being members of the family of God, adopted into his family, called by his name, Christians. What an honor that we serve a God who's committed to us more committed to us than we are to him. I love it in, in Ephesians when Paul says, he writes, he says, I'm writing to you saints in Ephesus. That's what you are. You're a saint. Defines us as our identity in Christ as a saint. Never define yourself as a sinner saved by grace. Never do that. Theologically, it's wrong. You're not a sinner saved by grace. You're now a saint who occasionally sins. You're a saint in the kingdom of God because what's God doing? He's in the business of restoration, restoring us back to the image of God that he calls us to be. The everlasting covenant is a profound and deep subject that invites us into a place where we truly, like those early Christians, can see our communities change. Is that okay? Can we stand together? I wonder if we could do that.